Ani is a graduate research assistant and a member of the Illinois Quantum Information Science and Technology, or IQUIS, program at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. He began his PhD research as a member of the Joint Quantum Institute at the University of Maryland, College Park, before moving to Illinois with his advisor, Dr. Elizabeth Goldschmidt. So, Donnie, uh, I'll turn it over to you. Hi. Um, I'm happy to be here. I'm excited to talk to all of you. Um, so yeah, as you mentioned, I started out at the University of Maryland, um, which this book is actually written by an alumni at the University of Maryland, and it's not a talk by me if I don't have my little, have, have a picture of my little helper shadow with me. But uh, I started my PhD at Maryland, and it really is a journey because we actually drove our half of our lab from DC to the middle of Illinois. Um, so my research topic, my research field in particular is atomic, molecular, and optical physics. In particular, I work in quantum optics, which is studying the quantum nature of light. And the type of research that I do is experimental. And kind of the overarching big picture of what we are working on is, say you have two quantum computers and they're separated by some distance, even a large distance, like intercontinental distances, what are those connections? Quantum computers, quantum things need to be connected in a quantum way. And we're really concerned about what are those connections? What are they gonna look like? What are they gonna require? And so zooming in my research in particular, uh, we kind of, we're concerned about these connections and what are they gonna be made out of? Well, they're gonna be made out of light and matter. And to start with light, light is a fantastic carrier of quantum information. One, Light's a quantum object. Two, light moves very, very fast. It moves at the speed limit of the universe. And three, light moves very fast and travels very, very far without getting lost. I mean, light travels 91.5 million miles from the sun to your eye. And you can use light as a qubit. And you might be saying, what, Donnie, how do you use light as a qubit? What are the zeros and ones? Well, here are a couple examples you can use two different colors, you can use two different paths that the light goes. And within that, you can even use the time that light um, arrives. If my light travels two different paths and they're of different lengths, the light will arrive at different times. And what my research focuses on is sure, light is fantastic at carrying information, but it's always moving at the speed of light. How do you hold on to that information? How do you store it? And that's where atoms in matter come in. And what we are working on is a device that we call a quantum memory that stores the information, uh, the quantum information that is carried by light. And that requires, you know, understanding the interaction between light and matter on a quantum mechanical scale. And the interaction between light and matter allows us to transfer the information that uh, light carries and transfer it to something stationary like matter. And we do that uh, with a very special class of atoms or family of atoms called the rare earths. So why is this important? Why is this research important? What are the applications? And really uh, for us, the novelty is being able to hold on to and store quantum information in what I would say is analogous to a quantum hard drive. And the applications, whether or not quantum computers ever become a realizable technology, that's an open question 50 years from now, 200 years from now. Quantum information, especially with light, has applications all over, including now in the present. Uh, for example, you can have things like cryptography where you're trying to send information and quantum mechanics tells us that with quantum cryptography that you have perfect security based on the laws of physics. And for us, that would mean, you know, storing this information for some amount of time and being able to transfer it in a secure way. But this has applications way beyond, or quantum information has applications way beyond this from geology, astronomy, and even medicine. I went to this fantastic talk um, that is from a faculty member who's now at Maryland where they use quantum mechanics and light to image down to single tumor cancer cells in blood that you wouldn't be able to see um, by conventional means. So what's the day in the life of an experimental physicist? And 
atomic physics? Well, I work a lot with optics. I spend a lot of time putting optics together, taking them apart, working with hardware. I work a lot with cryogenics um, and we get pretty cold. We get to 1.4 Kelvin uh, for our coldest system. And that's not even the coldest people work here. And to put that into perspective, that's minus 271 Celsius or minus 457 Fahrenheit. Um, I love telling people that I work with lasers. It's a great icebreaker. Everybody's like, oh, you work with lasers? That's so cool. Um, I do a fair amount of my own coding, either to simulate my system, to programming instruments in my lab. And on top of that, you know, I do things like I go to conferences, I give talks, um, actually I'm wearing the same shirt. I was at this conference uh, a month ago. It's the first conference uh, in person since COVID. And I sometimes do a fair bit of writing. Uh, I've been doing a tag up with someone that I know from the University of Maryland doing writing and illustration uh, for different scientific things that they have in mind. And my quantum journey, uh, going from mentors to things I found important. Well, the most important mentor I have right now is my advisor, Dr. Elizabeth Goldschmidt. She's great. In when we were at Maryland, I had a lot of other uh, great professors that were resources. And even in undergrad, I had a lot of great resources. And going as far back as high school, I did the International Baccalaureate Program. And that's where I started my journey. And I first heard about quantum mechanics. And I had really passionate teachers um, that I still talk to and reach out to every now and then. Um, and what have I found really important on you know, my personal journey? One, as an experimentalist, uh, is really to cope with things not working. Because as an experimentalist, things break all the time. And I spend probably about 99% of my time, you know, trying something in the lab and it not work and it doesn't work. And that's okay. And understanding that if it was easy, if things worked all the time, this research would have been done a long time ago. And another thing with is uh, that I find really important, especially now, is having a work-life balance, having hobbies outside of the lab, having friends, um, you know, having something to do outside of the lab and growing as a person, because. Yeah, when you're in the lab for so long, um, it can be very consuming. And sometimes you just need something to kind of boost you. And like I do pick up soccer with other people in the department and it's really fun and it gives you a nice boost of energy to go into the week with. And lastly, I guess you probably picked this up from the talk, but everybody is on a different journey. And like my STEM journey, my science journey has brought me around the world. Like I started out wanting to do biology and that brought me to Costa Rica for a while and uh, for a time I thought I wanted to be a chemist and that brought me to the UK and it's really important as a scientist to just remember that everybody's journey in science is different we're all working towards something greater than ourselves and it can be really easy to compare yourself to others but it's also very unfair to do to yourself and what's the one piece of advice I really want to give you? It's maybe a little bit funny to say, but uh, I had to think back to when was I your age and what's something that I really wish that I heard uh, from someone where I am now. And it's that it's okay to not know what you want to do when you grow up. I remember when I was in high school, um, there was a lot of pressure for us to kind of know what we wanted to do, jobs, college, et cetera. And everybody kind of expected us to have it all figured out, but it's okay if you don't. And it's okay to pick some route and realize it's not for you and find something that you're passionate about and pursue it. Like I started out wanting to be in biology. I wanted to be a paleontologist. And I realized that wasn't for me. I took physics classes in college and I had some fantastic professors that were really passionate and sparked a passion in me that caused me to change route. And I'm really glad I did. And life has a way of just having things work out and it'll be okay. I 
I promise. And lastly, I just want to thank you for, for having me. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. And this is such a great program. And I'm, yeah, I'm, I feel really privileged to be here. Thank you so much.